There's a knot in my ball! <laughs> hey all y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carrie. This is where I talk about knitting, my tips, my tricks, my opinions, and my preferences. And we've all been there. Or, if you're just starting out in knitting, you will find yourself there. Where you're knitting along and boom, there's a knot. Mmm, pesky little knot. Unfortunately, in these situations, there's really only one thing to do, and that is to cut out the knot and rejoin the yarn as if you're starting a new ball. But there are many different ways that you can join the ball of yarn into your work. Some are better than others. All of it is a matter of personal preferences. And today, I'm gonna to share with you my favorite and least favorite methods for joining yarn into your knitted work. So if you wanna find out about that, Hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, and let's knit. For a little bit of fun, I thought I would rank these methods that I'm going to show today from number five, which is my least favorite, to number one, which will be my most favorite. And I would love at the end of this, after you watched it, to get your own thoughts because, of course, like always with knitting, there's more than one way to do things, and it's a matter of personal preference, most of the time, which one you choose to use. And also, just know going into this that all the methods I'm going to show, all of them, I think, have their place. They're all tools in your toolbox. I know I say this all the time, but it's true. Um, but in ranking these methods, what I really am looking for, the criteria that I'm looking at is, one, that it's secure, that when I join that ball of yarn into the work, it's not going to unravel, it's not going to come undone. And the other criteria that I look for for joins is, is it something relatively easy to do? Not overly fiddly. <laughs> That's really important to me that it's not overly fiddly because a lot of times I'm knitting in my couch or in the car and I don't want to have to like find a flat stable surface so that I can do a join. And again, this is all my personal preference. I will be stating my opinion strongly, but that doesn't mean I'm right or correct. And if you disagree with me, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. Or if you agree with me, love to hear about it in the comments. Or if you have another method that you think works better than anything I cover today, let me know in the comments. If you're like me and you, when you learned how to knit, you were basically told to avoid knots whenever possible, maybe just hearing magic knot, it speaks for itself as to why this is at number five. But this method for joining yarn has become wildly popular the last couple of years. I see it come up all the time. People are always like, I love magic knot. I love my magic knot. Gotta do the magic knot. Uh, what is the magic knot? <laughs> Let me show you. You take the tail of ball A and you bring it under ball B to create an X. And then you tie a very simple overhand knot like this. When you do that, the pink, you can slide it. So the next thing you do is you repeat that with ball B. So I'm gonna take the tail of ball B, bring it under the strand of A, like this, and tie a knot. Now, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull these strands thusly, and those two knots butt up against each other and lock. Now what you can do is trim these tails very close to the yarn. Thusly. So you have very tiny tails. And look, I'll keep pulling. That knot's not going anywhere. Right away, you might be looking at that and like, I now understand why it's called magic knot because there's no tails to weave in, and that's magic. The reason I don't tend to turn to magic knot, however, is, first of all, let me just say, I should, 
generally not are considered less than ideal, even a faux pas in knitting. And there's several reasons why. One is knots tend not to be very secure. Any knot, even magic knot, can come undone. The other reason knots generally are not considered great, and I think this is true of magic knot no matter what, is if it's a worn item, that where that knot is can be a little extra irritation. Um, think about socks. If you were to have a magic knot on the foot of a sock, and that's always rubbing against your skin, mm, mm, not great. Even magic knot, you're going to run into that problem. So this is not a method that I really think about using at all for garments. But I will use this, for example, with cotton if I'm making a dishcloth or if I were making a dish towel, anything like that. Um, any kind of home good item that you're not wearing that's made out of cotton or cellulose fiber or even acrylic, this may not be a bad method to go with because a lot of join techniques that I'm gonna discuss a little later on do not work for cotton. They do not work for slippery yarns. And I don't think Magic Knot is a terrible way to join in yarn. It's not an inappropriate way to join in yarn. I just think it's very situational and it's not one that I would turn to regularly. Like, to me, this is just not a go-to method. I'll be honest, this method, when I was a new knitter and I first learned, was like <gasps> magic. I thought it was just the most amazing joint ever, and I loved it, and I used it a lot when I was a younger knitter. No, not so much. So what is the spitted splice? Spit splice got its name for a reason. And that's because I've heard, I don't know if it's true, but I have heard that enzymes in our spit help the felting process. So I'm going to literally put the yarn in my mouth. Get nice and saturated with spit. All right, and you just start rubbing those fibers together to get them to mat. So the way felting works is animal fibers are made up of keratin, which are little scales along the hair shaft. And those scales open up with heat and moisture. And if fibers rub together with those scales, the scales start locking together and it starts matting. And that's what creates felt. Anyway, here we go. So, yeah, okay, I got this felted. So there we go, and I'm pulling, pulling, and you'll see that is a nice strong join. Um, and you can see, like the magic knot, a felted join has no ends you have to weave in. This method only works with animal fiber. It works best with 100% wool yarns that are not superwash. The process to make a yarn a superwash requires manipulating those scales so that they don't lock together. There's various methods by which that is done. One method requires putting the yarn through a chemical bath that sort of files down the rough edges of the scale so they don't lock together as easily. That kind of superwash yarn can sometimes be felted, sometimes, but generally speaking, if it says superwash, you're gonna have a hard time getting a felted join to work. Um, felted joins will work on some um, yarns that are a blend, so say a wool acrylic blend or a wool cotton blend, depending on how much wool content is in that fiber, you might be able to get a felted join, but it may not work either. You know, you kind of have to test it out. The other reason I don't love felted join is this right here where I created the felt. It is ever so slightly a thicker, gauge than the rest of the ball. If you think about it, you're taking two strands of yarn, you're putting all those plies together, you're basically doubling the number of plies in that spot where you're felting them together. Um, a way to think about 
whether your work looks good is to stand three feet back from it and look at the piece and go, do you see anything that's off? Most people are not going to notice that slight change of thickness, but it just bothers me that it's there. It just does. It bothers me. It always bothers me. So it's just not a method I tend to go towards because I'm like, oh, it's just, it bothers me. <laughs> Hear that? That is the sound of cheers everywhere. This has become a wildly popular join the last few years. I came across it when I was working on a big lace project and the felted join was not working and so I was looking for other ways to join yarn and avoid tails and I came across the Russian join and I have to say, when I first came across it and was using it, I was a convert. I loved it. Um, the way that it works is you need a tapestry needle. N not the tapestry needles we usually find in the uh, knitting section because they're very blunt tip and they're very large. I prefer to have a sharp tapestry needle that you would find more in the sewing section. It does help. Here is strand A and strand B. And you start Russian join by splitting your plies in half. And I'm going to just thread two of the plies here, all right? Now what you do is you're going to take this and you're going to put it back down the center of the yarn. This is the tricky part of the Russian join, which is to bring that needle really down through the center of the yarn as much as possible. You want to weave it back fairly far. Now, when you do this, you're gonna pull that through, and when you do, you wanna make sure, right here, see? You got this loop of yarn right there. You want that to stay. So I'm gonna pull this through while maintaining that loop of yarn. There we go. And this, these, these two plies I'm going to ignore. <laughs> Just ignore them. Now I'm going to take my second strand of yarn. I'm gonna unravel this as well split those plies. Then I'm going to thread two plies from color B and I'm going to thread color B strands through that loop I created in color A. Next I'm going to take color B and I'm going to weave it down that yarn just like I did with color A. And what this does is it creates two interlocking loops. So color A and color B each have a loop and they're locked together. I'm going to pull gently the tail of color B to tighten up its loop. And then I'm going to come over to color A and pull that tail I wove through the yarn to tighten up that loop. And now the two strands are locked together. Now I've got all these extra strands here and all of these strands you can trim away. However, you're always going to get a little bit of these strands um, are going to remain and it's ideal to make sure those little extra bits are kept to the back of the work. So I knit past this point in the work and at that point I will just loosely cut these out. So, um, you can see here, still notice it's holding just fine. And you can trim here and here as well. That is the completed Russian join. It is fiddly having to weave the end back into the yarn. Um, and you do need a good section of yarn to do that. I didn't weave that tail back as far as I normally would. I would normally do that for a good five to six inches. But once you've mastered this technique, you have a very clean, secure join here. So why is this not my favorite method? <laughs> this method, like the felted join, really only works well, really well, with um, wool yarns. Because much like felted yarn, this is really relying on the scales of the yarn to be rubbing against each other and kind of catching each other. 
I've tried doing this with cotton yarn. It does not work. And that's because cotton yarn is slippery. And so when you go to do this, that end that's back here just goes right out. So this doesn't really work so well with cotton yarn unless you combine it with another technique called a braided join, um, which is not something I'm going to get into in this video. Editing Carrie here. I just wanted to note because I kept saying cotton yarn, Russian join won't work with any yarn that is smooth like cotton. Any cellulose based fiber, silk, acrylic, Russian join doesn't work unless it's combined with another technique. But again, it's really most effective with wool yarns. It's kind of fiddly. Um, and I I very rarely turn to this method anymore. This is one of the easiest methods of joining in yarn there possibly is to demonstrate. Uh, the concept is very simple. I'm gonna use two separate colors so that you can just see what's going on. So here's my old yarn here. And here is my new ball of yarn here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just hold these two together as I knit. What I want to make sure though when I do this is that my tail of my new ball is to my left and the tail of my old ball of yarn is to my right. If you knit continental that is going to be opposite. You will hold the tail of your new ball to your right and the tail of the old ball will be in your left hand. And then I'm just going to hold these two strands of yarn together and knit them as one. So I'm basically doubling up the two strands of yarn together. Once I've knitted four or five stitches, six stitches is good, I drop the old ball of yarn and then I continue the rest of the row with my new ball of yarn. And there we go. Now, Obviously, because I use two different colors here, <laughs> you're going to see right here where those double strands are. And when you knit back, I'll just do that real quickly. So I'm knitting back, and when I come to those double stitches, I just work both strands of yarn together as if they were one. And ideally what will happen is that the yarn from the old ball of yarn will fall to the back of the work, and the new ball will be at the front of the work. Um, that's not really something you have to worry so much about, however, because you really use this technique with just one color normally. This is a very discreet join. Um, obviously, had I used the same color, you would not be able to see any anything here that indicated that I had joined in a new ball of yarn. And because the old yarn is knitted with the new yarn, this is incredibly stable. The one thing about this method, you're still going to have your tail here from your new ball that's going to have to be woven into your work. And I personally prefer to take the tail of my old yarn and weave it in for a few stitches as well, just to give this some extra security to make sure that this is all gonna stay together. Um, so you are gonna have tails that you still need to weave in. And of course, the other drawback to this method is it doesn't really work so well with stripes. There's one other reason though, this is not my number one choice <laughs> for joins and that is for cotton yarns it it works don't get me wrong it totally works for cotton yarns but i don't think it works as well i think where you've joined in that new ball of yarn is a little bit more obvious when you look at the work you can see that the yarn is thicker in that spot and that has to do with the nature of cotton in particular cotton gives a very crisp stitch definition and any mistake in cotton is just very obvious in a way that wool isn't and so when you use this method with cotton it's just it's there it's just very apparent that the stitches there are just a little bit thicker you can feel it a little bit more um, so I don't love this for cotton yarns and plant-based fibers, but for any kind of wool yarn, this works great. For acrylic yarn, this works great. This works great in a lot of situations. All right, it's time. My number one method for joining in balls of yarn is 
join in your ball of yarn, weave your tails in later. It's nothing fancy. <laughs> this is like the least fancy way of joining in a ball of yarn, but it pretty, it will always work. It works in any situation. It works with any fiber. Um, this is the method I go to pretty much 98% of the time. What am I talking about? So what I like to do is take the tail of my old yarn and hold that in the hand I am not tensioning the new ball of yarn with. I also will take the tail of the new yarn and hold it in that same hand. And this just makes sure that I don't accidentally knit with the wrong strand or the wrong end of the yarn. And now I'm just going to knit. Once I got a couple stitches done, I drop the tails and I just work across. So the big drawback to doing this, besides having tails that you're going to have to work in, but you know what? That, that's life. That's knitting. In knitting, you're going to have to weave in tails. <laughs> the big drawback though, besides tails, is that where you do that join, these this stitch, which is the old stitch and the new stitch here, tend to get loose and sloppy. And um, to fix that, I just kind of tug a little bit on the tails to tighten everything up. To avoid that, to help make this a little bit more stable until I'm ready to weave in my tails later, I will just do a little overhand knot thusly. And that overhand knot though, is gonna get undone when I weave those tails in later while I'm doing my finishing work. But I'm gonna go ahead and knit back across. But yeah, there, the color change is done. Really simple. Like, you cannot get more simple than this method. When I'm ready to weave in my tails, I just undo this little overhand knot and I will weave in my tails that will fix any tension with these stitches. If I do a good weave with my tails, which you need to be able to do no matter what, because you're always going to have tails to weave in, that join will always be nice and secure and unproblematic. And, you know, I get it. I get why Magic Knot and Russian join have become such popular methods for knitters to join in new balls of yarn. I mean, it is enticing not having to weave in more tails than is necessary. But being happy with the results of my work is ultimately more important than weaving in ends, and this method works no matter what. This always works. It doesn't matter what fiber I'm using, and it the only time this may not work is with some novelty yarns, but novelty yarns are always their own beast. The rules or guidelines for knitting with novelty yarns, like, they, it, they almost always don't apply. <laughs> so what do you think? What's your favorite method for joining in new balls of yarn? Are you like, yes, I agree, just weave in the ends, live with it? Or are you like, no, Russian join all the way, magic not all the way? You know, again, this is all a matter of preference. This is all a matter of what works for you. You are the boss of your knitting. You get to do what you like to do with it. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If so, please give it a thumbs up and share it with your knitting friends. Um, I'm very excited because as of today, I am up to 91 uh, subscribers. So I'm very close to getting to 100 subscribers. In YouTube terms, it's still very, like, not even small potatoes. I'm like a little spud, a little, like, eye on a potato. <laughs> But what happens when I get to 100 subscribers is I get a personalized YouTube domain. Right now, I'm youtube.com slash random characters. But if I get to 100 subscribers, I can be youtube.com slash Carrie Craft Geek. So I really want to get to 100 subscribers. If you want to help me on that journey, please subscribe and hit the notification bell which will let you know whenever I upload a new video. I hope you have a wonderful day, evening, weekend, weeknight, whenever you may be watching this. And as always, happy health and happy knitting. Bye. But that tent, oh, sorry, over, okay.
industry standard says that it's acceptable to have up to three knots of yarn. Blah, three knots of yarn. You probably can see the big advantage. Oops. There we go. <laughs> Number four for joining methods is the belted join, aka the split spice. Spit spice. Blah, blah, blah. Split spice. Again, spit spice. Spit spice. Say it five times fast. Spit spice. Spit spice. Spit spice. Spit spice. Talking about knots, I just can't. It's hard for me with knots. I just, it's so ingrained in my soul not to put knots in your knitting. Knots to do knots. It's so ingrained in me not to do it that it's like bad form that I just see the magic knot in knitting and I'm like, oh, oh, it makes my soul ache. I mean, I've done it, I've used it and it definitely has its place, but there's always this little voice in the back of my head going, you should not be doing knots in your knitting. But I'm the boss of my knitting. I get to do what I want with my knitting. I'm the boss of my knitting. Hello. Boss knitter. Boss knitter in the house. Boop, 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 boop. 